So today I want to make an interview with uh, Satya Narayana Das, Babaji and Jessica Richmond, two people that promote Vedic psychology around the world. And we have this opportunity to speak with them in the flat of our friend Ella Zrubwidmajska, who is organizing and inviting teachers to Poland and spreading the knowledge about Ayurveda, spirituality and so on. What is this uh, thing that you teach? What is it uh, about when you go and do the, the courses around? What we teach is about the human mind. And human mind is one of the most important component in the human body. Hmm. Because our whole life functions according to the state of our mind. What we do that depends on our thoughts and thoughts arise in the mind. When we say that somebody has a good character or somebody has a bad character or somebody is a nice person, gentle person, that statement is actually about the mind of that person. It's not the external physical appearance but about what is the state of that person's mind. So we teach about the functions of the mind and what influences the mind and how we can control the mind to bring out a better behavior for a particular person. And then when you teach about that theory, what are the practical aspects of the teachings that you do? Practical aspects are that uh, we uh, give certain exercises which uh, Jessica has developed because mm -hmm. she's a psychotherapist trained psychotherapist and she has been working with this Vedic psychology. So she has developed certain exercises which she can maybe explain more about it. So we teach people about four parts of their mind, the ego, the unconscious mind, the semi-conscious mind, and their intelligence and kind of how they function. And then we actually highlight each part of the mind by using these like interactive exercises where you'll either get with one partner and see like your ego showing up um, or you'll do group exercises and then we kind of debrief after the exercise because oftentimes when you're at a workshop and you're learning about something like your ego you can understand the theory very well and you're like oh I've got this I, I'm never like that person I never do that but you actually do and that's the whole idea of, of the practical exercises is to bring out your own stuff that you think you don't do or you don't have and, and then so, during the courses, was your experience with this? People really showed up? People, it, the ego exercise in particular is very intense. And so at first we used to warm people up to it. And sometimes we do it at the beginning and that's very, it depends on how the group is and if they're ready for it. But with certain crowds, we start right out of the gates with that. Certain other crowds we warm up to it, but it's very intense to actually see your own ego. And then when it happens, still you don't realize it's your ego. You still think it's the other person. Like, you triggered me, this exercise sucks, Vedic psychology sucks, but really it's your ego reacting to getting, to getting some feedback that doesn't fit the concept of who the ego thinks he or she is. Why do you think it's so difficult? Well, because everybody has a concept about oneself. And everybody thinks that I'm a nice person. Nobody likes to see one's own faults. That is actually one of the basic characteristic of ego or eye consciousness. So it it takes a lot of like guts <laughs> to accept your own mistakes and your own flaws and defects and blemishes. Even when they are pointed out, even when you actually can know that really I have a problem, still it is very hard for the ego. Because ego is like the king in this body. <laughs> ego is the master. And like a king owns and you know controls everything and doesn't like to see its own defects. If someone points a defect to the ego, to a king, then king is ready to you know hang you. <laughs> so our ego functions like that. And this uh, year you've been traveling around and made some courses, no? How's the, the experience of it, the reception, and from course to course, how does it develop for you also when you do it? Yeah, we gave courses, actually we gave courses here in Poland, we gave in France, we gave in America, in a big yoga center, Kripalu, and also in a hospital. 
So it has uh, improved over the time because this is the first time we did that and it, it works very nice. People like it, they appreciate and uh, they actually enjoy it. We got very good reports whenever we did the course and we have been invited again to do it. So at the end they managed to see this uh, ego point and made it positive. Yeah, so by that time the course is over, they realized that actually what we did to them was good for them. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a bitter pill at the beginning. <laughs> it's like, you know, you have boil on your body and doctor wants to operate on it, so you, you feel the pain, but ultimately you know that it's good for you. And you mentioned this uh, hospital, so what is exactly that you did in the hospital beside the courses? So at the hospital, we're working on training a group of 15 psychotherapists on how to use Vedic psychology. So right now, yeah. it's just the two of us who are teaching people, and anybody who's interested. But now we're actually going to, this is the first set of professionals that we'll train on how to actually use the techniques, and we'll be taking data as well to learn, you know, so we can actually, in six months from now, have a report and say, okay, with th these 150 um, teenagers who they're trying it on, what actually works and what doesn't. How, how did they improve or how didn't they? So they'll be, not only will we, will we be training them and they'll be using it, but we'll be collecting data. So we'll have actual research on from a, a big hospital in the U.S. So the doctors from the classic medicine there, they're very interested in feeling like to, to apply it in yes. their practice? Yeah. Yeah, they are, they, because they can, when you explain the theory, it makes a lot of sense to them and in fact we demonstrated to them we asked them that okay you bring some of your toughest case which you have been struggling so they brought the case and uh, you know she figured it out in 10 minutes that this is the problem and they were very surprised <laughs> because they they have been trying to find out what actually is the problem and she just heard the case and asked few questions and she immediately said okay this is where the problem lies and uh, they were actually agreeing, yeah, this could be the problem, and they worked on that. And the nice thing about Vedic psychology, too, is that often, you know, with Western psychology, the psychologist is like the doctor, and they know everything. And yeah, I was just the, about to ask, yeah, what's the difference yeah. between them? So it's like you're the patient who doesn't know anything, you're just sick, you know, and we're going to fix you because we know everything. Whereas with Vedic psychology, we're actually teaching you the parts of your mind and how to manage them. There's a lot of differences, but that's one nice one. So. Even now, I had already taught the therapist the model of the four parts of the mind and how these parts dynamic, dynamically interact. So they already saw that I had it drawn up on the board. So then when they gave me a difficult case, I just walked them through the model. And not only was it like that I got it quickly, they got it with me quickly. They're like, oh, of course. Of course the ego was doing that and then the mind was, and of course the intelligence was sleeping. And so it was very easy for them to see what I was saying and not feel like they're going to have to come to me every single time to get the answer. So I was educating them as well, which is a very powerful part of Vedic psychology. And how such a session look for you? That how is it different your Vedic psychology session from your psychotherapy session from before? So Vedic psychology, one part is the education. So once I figure out what's going on with them, then I'll teach them, teach the client what's going on. And then the second part is that there's a spiritual component. So depending on the client, if they're open to that, we can teach them you know, how to transcend their mind. So not only just here's the parts of your mind, but there's actually more to the story. Mm. And Babaji's really good at talking about that. So what's that component <laughs> that we heard about? Well, that component <laughs> is the secret component. <laughs> <laughs> and that we have to first, of course, see whether the patient is interested in that or not, because sometimes people, they don't want to, you know, they go into the deep waters, so to say. So that part is that uh, in the West we think, or the modern psychology thinks, that mind is actually the source of consciousness. But Vedic psychology very clearly says that mind is matter, it is inert. It's just like any other machine, the part in the body, you know, like you have your heart or you even have your finger. Right? So mind is also a component like that, but very subtle component. And the source of consciousness is what we call as Purusha, Atma, which is translated as soul and that is a different type of energy it's a, it's conscious by nature it is intrinsically intrinsically conscious mind is not conscious inherently it, the consciousness in the mind in the ego in the intellect 
all this and even in the physical body is actually borrowed from the soul. That's why it is possible to give anesthesia and make a particular part of your body unconscious. If the consciousness was the natural part, natural function of any part of your body, you could not make it unconscious by anesthesia. But soul cannot be made unconscious because that's its nature. Just like sugar is sweet by nature, you cannot remove sweetness out of sugar unless you destroy it. So what is the bridge between the consciousness and the mechanical inert mind? The bridge is that there is something called vital air. In Sanskrit it is called prana. And through the prana, the consciousness from the soul comes into the mind. And from the mind it comes into the senses and then to the physical body. So this is one very important distinction between Vedic psychology and the modern I often hear three words. One is consciousness, the other is awareness, and the third is mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Could you clarify this for me? Awareness and mindfulness are the functions of consciousness. Any Anybody who is conscious can have awareness of things, whether that is self-awareness or awareness of the objects around it. That is the function of consciousness. Anything which is inert cannot be aware of itself or anything other than the object. So when we say that, you know, develop awareness, develop mindfulness means mind is usually just running here and there to the object and not being aware of itself. So that awareness is developed because there is a consciousness in it and of course that consciousness is coming from the soul, that's what we are trying to explain. And how's the reception of that component, secret component so far? Well, it depends. I mean, of course, we don't try to make it something very esoteric so that people may have some kind of opposition to it, but uh, it is there. I mean, when you explain it properly, give examples, you know, I give an example like you have your, for example, there is a car. So car has got various components in it, but it runs because there is a battery. If you remove the battery, then none of the components will work. So battery is that which supplies energy to all the parts of the body. So this, similarly in, in our body, which is like a car, you can compare it like a car or like a computer, you know. Computer has got hardware, software, but then it needs battery, right? Without that it won't work. So that battery is that which makes everything work. So when you have your screen and you are seeing something there, it's because there's a current in the computer. But that is not the inherent characteristic of the screen. That has been supplied from another source. And for you, Jessica, what was the shift in your consciousness when you started to apply the Vedic uh, psychology in your therapies more than the previous psychology um, therapies? So with the Vedic psychology, another part that we didn't talk about yet, but using this awareness, you know, I had to become more quiet and still and aware with my clients to be able to see what was actually driving their thoughts and their behaviors. You know, oftentimes when, a, oftentimes when a client comes in, they come in with a set of just behaviors or feelings, you know, but they don't, we, we don't know where they're coming from. So they'll come in and maybe they just tried to commit suicide or they just, you know, physically hurt someone or they're addicted to drugs. There's some reason why they're there, but it's just this, you know, the, the, the um, dots are not connected to the story. We don't know what's driving it. So with Vedic psychology, you know, we look into the unconscious mind called the chitta. And in there, we try to find what, what, what memory file we call it, or what app, is driving this behavior. You know, because it's unconscious, so they're not able to make that connection. And so for me, I have to become a lot more still to be able to see that and to get my line of questioning to go with them and to not get distracted by, you know, the ego is going to throw up all these other stories. You know, about she did that and he did that and my husband's a jerk and what all the other drama going on instead of actually just looking because, you know, it's unconscious so that person doesn't realize what's driving them even mm -hmm. when I explain the theory so it takes a lot of just kind of sticking to it and being still with them and sticking to, w <laughs> to what I'm trying to look for instead of getting distracted letting my own mind get distracted by all the other dis um, what is it called, like fuzz, you know distract that's what it sounds like when they're going off when I'm trying to get in deep to that samskara. So you're trying to get deep into the samskara yeah. you call it so what is exactly that samskara? 
it's what we call like a memory file, which, you know, is basically something that's happened to them, anything. It could be a good thing or a bad thing. Anything that's happened in their life gets stored in the unconscious mind as a memory. And the one I'm looking for is the one, I mean, we have hundreds if not thousands from this life and past lives. So I'm trying to find the one that's driving the current behavior that, or thoughts or feelings that are unhealthy, that are hurting them. So if it's a drug addict, you know, why are you addicted? They'll say, you know, I don't know, I just love heroin, it's great. I feel great, I feel free. Well, why, you don't feel free when you're not on it? You know, what, what's making you feel not free? So you have to keep going with the line of questioning to find out, oh, it turns out that my mom was very controlling and kept me feeling stuck, you know? And so that memory file or samskara is um, actually attached to that memory are feelings that are unprocessed undigested and those feelings of feeling stuck or controlled or unworthy, depressed, all those feelings that happened when this person, this drug addict was maybe 15 years old, now he's 45, so 30 years later those same feelings are actually driving his behaviors today. So we're calling that a samskar or a memory file and so the idea is to get your finger on it, figure out what the file is and then to bring it up into the consciousness, to the awareness and process it. And where is the spiritual component playing the thing right now? In this? The awareness. With the awareness. Yeah, because it, they weren't aware of it and just got, lo it just got, un it's an undigested experience there driving them still. So bringing it up and becoming aware of it completely with the, the, the feelings, processing the feelings. And then every time it gets triggered, because as life happens, anytime this person feels controlled or lack of freedom, that, that memory file gets triggered. The, the mind will do a match and go, ooh, I've felt that before. And then it re you're reacting and reliving all those experiences uh, um, of what happened when you were 15, not when you're 45. So the spiritual component is teaching him how to become mindful and aware of that so he doesn't react. So he just goes, oh, there that is. That's that old thing. That's not me. That's not happening to me now. I'm, I'm you know, first of all, I'm not this body and I'm, I'm not this crazy mind reacting. You know, I'm the soul and I can just watch. And then the... You as uh, having a devotional lifestyle, let's say, you see that this knowledge also works for somebody who's not exactly in this path full-heartedly, but also for people who live a uh, normal mundane life? No, there is no such thing as mundane life or not mundane life. Everybody has life, everybody has consciousness, everybody is a spiritual being. Okay? So you cannot deny that. You may agree to it or you may not agree but truth does not change because of your agreement or not agreement. Fact is that you are a spiritual being, you are a conscious person and you have a material body. So this knowledge can be applied anywhere to anybody if you are willing to do that. It's not that you have to change some dress or you have to you know, live in a particular ashram or something like that. If you understand this then you can practice it anywhere. So the important thing is this identity. Important thing is proper understanding of your yourself and then acting on that understanding. So the root cause of problem actually is ignorance. That's what we say that the root cause of every problem is ignorance. Even when you say unconscious mind, the very word unconscious means I'm ignorant of it. Right? Conscious means being aware, knowing, mindful. Unconscious means unaware, unmindful, not my ignorance. So that is what is driving the problem or that crazy behavior or unhealthy action. So we try to educate people along with it. This is one very important component of Vedic psychology that it's not that you just tell them to do certain things but actually you make them aware of their, their own problems and what is the solution. So the education is the important part of it. And now uh, talking about education and also about your personal journey through that Vedic psychology, uh, there's a book of yours on Vedic psychology that's about to come out. Can you first tell how did you meet at the beginning? What was the experience of first meeting and what drive you to at the end also write a book together and work together? Well, she came in contact with my brother, Dr. Pratap Chahan, and through him she got introduced to me. She heard my lectures over the YouTube and that was very fascinating for her. So then she came to see me in Vrindavan and then uh, we discussed and 
you know, I gradually started learning Vedic psychology from me. And I had this idea for a long time, but I, I had never put into practice because I am not a psychotherapist. I know I'm not professional in this field. My field is different. But I had developed the theory myself over the period of time studying the Vedic scriptures and I wanted that this should be utilized. So when she came and she said she is a psychotherapist, she works in a hospital, then we said, oh, this is good. And in fact, uh, it came through the book Hitopdes, which it seems you gave it to her. <laughs> So, I showed him. Uh, you wrote him. So she started reading this and then she said, well, why not use these stories to educate these kids and, you know, solve their problem. So then I started helping her and that's how it gradually developed. Mm. So then she, in the summer, she came and lived in Vrindavan with me and uh, I had written a lot of things about this, I mean, not really as a book, but I had many ideas which I had gathered and we said we should make a book out of it, which was also my desire, so she is helping with that. Do you plan to also, one thing is book, education, the other is doing courses, but now we know people have uh, special relationships with their mobile devices and electronic kits, and a lot of people just learn vast uh, body of knowledge through through internet. So do you have any plan in giving uh, unpaid or paid courses that are dedicated to Vedic psychology? Yeah, we have plan for that, that there will be courses through that and as you mentioned internet, is actually also giving consultancy through Skype. Besides, you know, where she works, she deals with the patients, but if people want to have personal consultancy, then they can also have through the Skype. But we also have a website where we post questions, answers, people write and we reply to them. But ultimately, yes, we would like to have some course through the media, internet. Mm. So where can we right now follow your content? That is there any blog or something that's, uh, that we can know? to subscribe the question answer yeah you can follow at uh, www.jiva.org slash psychology well that's great so I uh, just to clarify the Vedic psychology the term itself and uh, the technique or the study of it it's the term is developed by you yeah this is I coined this term because there's no s specific book of Vedic psychology. I mean, we have scriptures, we have Vedas, we have Upanishads, we have Puranas, we have Itihasa, Mahabharata, Ramayana, all this, Bhagavad Gita. So these are books and then we have Darshanas, you know, like Sankhya, Nyaya, Yoga Sutras. So in all these books, there is a lot of talk about mind and how it functions, but not in a very, you know, what you can say in a very okay. organized manner yeah. that it's just one place they talk about mind but according to the need then there is something spoken about mind something sometimes something said about ego so I have actually gathered all that together and like put put the pieces together so to say mm. and That's great. then devise this feels system. very inspiring but what you do and that the reception is good, so I wish you a more good reception. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the interview. Thank you. Arriba. Yes, we are.